Hello everybody, and today we'll be taking a look at the performance of the Intel Pentium E2220, a 12 year old processor that hit the consumer market all the way back in 2008. Based on its Newegg reviews, this chip was actually pretty capable back then, offering good performance and great overclocking potential at an attractive price. However, that was back in 2008, likely running on computers with Windows XP or Vista, not in 2020 where most of us use Windows 10. We'll still be taking a look at this processor's performance in Windows XP, but just how well does this chip hold up 12 years later in a much more demanding environment? Environment. Honestly, better than I expected, but I set the bar pretty low. But before we get into the benchmarks, I had to actually build the system. Well, not build it, but swap a CPU and graphics card. Originally, this motherboard came with the Intel Pentium 4 631, a single core processor clocked at 3 GHz that never much impressed me. I also installed my own G4 6200A into the system, but that was considered low end even before it was released 16 years ago. Point is, I wanted to give this computer a performance boost, so I swapped the 631 for the E2220 and the 6200A for the 9800 GTX Plus, a significantly more powerful combination. However, when compared to the Pentium 4 631, the E2220 did ship with a 600MHz slower clock speed, had a smaller L2 cache size, and had about 83 million less processing die transistors, which did cause me to second guess this quote unquote upgrade. But I still had good expectations for the testing, primarily due to its true dual core nature, rather than the hyper-threading utilized by the 631. The E2220 released back in March of 2008, a year after after Vista, but still around the time the Windows XP saw mass popularity. Given Vista's, um, reputation, I opted to test the system on XP in 10 rather than Vista in 10. The reason I tested the chip on multiple operating systems was so we could roughly see how it would have held up around the time of its release date and how well it holds up 12 years later. One tiny little problem though, the drive I had Windows 10 installed on ran into some issues following the hardware swap. Hypothetically, I should have been able to simply reuse the same hard drive and install, which I was able to do with the XP drive, but the drive I had Windows 10 on got corrupted along the way. When I tried booting into it with the new system specs, it automatically tried to repair itself, but was unsuccessful in doing so. I tried resetting the PC, reverting to old restore points, swapping hardware other than the processor, but nothing really worked. I mean, I was able to get into safe mode, but not all drivers are properly loaded there, so I couldn't conduct any accurate benchmarking. At this point, I had already invested double the amount of time that it would have taken to simply reinstall the operating system, so I gave up on recovering the drive and threw a new install on a newer SATA drive. But when I mean newer, I mean newer than the ancient IDE drive that I was previously using because this newer drive was manufactured all the way back in 2006. It's a 100 gigabyte, 5400 RPM piece of crap Hitachi drive that had a stain on it. I don't know when or where I got that drive or what the stain's from, but for some reason the drive still worked, so I used it. But hey, while Windows is installing, how about you leave a like, comment, or consider subscribing because you made it this far in the video, which means there's a decent chance that you actually enjoyed the content. Thanks. Eventually I got into Windows and was almost ready to start benchmarking the system, the final step being the installation of the graphics drivers. I found the right ones pretty easily and started the install along with a few other programs such as a hardware monitor and MSI Afterburner. Two of those three setups actually completed with the graphics drivers being the only one that didn't. After an hour of troubleshooting it became clear that this configuration wasn't going to cooperate so I ended up swapping the 9800 GTX Plus for the superior AMD V5800 Pro. This required a slight modification to the box PC's chassis, but was definitely worth it since its drivers actually decided to work on this system. You probably haven't heard much about this card since it was sold as a workstation GPU when it was released back in 2010, but from my experience it holds up just fine even in newer games like Fortnite. When it was finally all set up and all the drivers were sorted out, I then started a bit of testing on the system, starting with how it performed in general operating system usage in Windows 10. With a fresh install of Windows and no programs running in the background, the CPU usage was around 1-2% with RAM in a stable 1GB of utilization. Also, during a stint of boredom, I discovered that by simply moving the mouse around the screen, I can get the CPU usage as high as 8%. Not really a benchmark, but it showcases just how unsuited this processor is for an intensive operating system such as Windows 10. This began to become increasingly clear the more I tried to use the system, with Windows Edge showing significant lag and YouTube videos occasionally stuttering. On the bright side, it ran exponentially smoother than the single core Pentium that used to be in the system, but then again, I think a good Intel Atom could outperform that processor. Regardless, the E2220 was able to hold up to a respectable degree while browsing around the internet and completing various tasks in Windows 10.
The first benchmark I ran on this system was a synthetic one with Passmark Performance Test 9. I chose 9 instead of the more recent 10 due to 10's lack of support for Windows XP and I don't know if it really makes a difference but it's something to keep in mind on the off chance that it does. The only real noteworthy thing from this test was the score penalization received since the monitor utilized cannot support the desired resolution. In the end, the overall Passmark rating was 795.9, placing this pitiful system in the 10th percentile. Also, how did someone get a score of 0? Like, that's so low, it's impressive. The first proper gaming benchmark I conducted on this computer was of Portal 2, and the results not only surprised me, but gave me a hope for this dated processor. I was able to run the game in a resolution of 1600 by 900 with all the highest settings aside from V-Sync and was able to pull an average frame rate at 54 FPS. Sometimes it was a bit too much screen tearing for my taste though, and if I was to run this game on this computer for an extended amount of time, I'd likely lower some settings and toggle on V-Sync instead. Since that was so successful, I then ran some Cluster Truck, making it the newest game that ran well on this configuration. This game doesn't have much in the way of graphical customization, so for this title I ended up running the game in 800 by 600 with the fantastic preset selected. With these settings, the game was playable and the average frame rate of 29 FPS was pretty consistent throughout testing. The only real issue with this one was longer than usual load times, which was likely due to the high utilization of the CPU and system memory. I also tried playing some Counter-Strike Global Offensive on the system, which didn't turn out so well. In 720p with all the lowest settings selected, the average frame rate was, well, pretty bad. The overlay software didn't want to work for some reason, so I I can't get an exact number, but just by looking at it, you can tell that this game is not playable in a competitive setting. Afterwards, I played a story about my uncle. Similarly to Cluster Truck, this game also doesn't have much in the way of graphical customization, but I turned the FOV to about half and toggled off motion blur. With these settings and a resolution of 1600 by 900, the average frame rate came to be 46 FPS, more than enough to experience this masterpiece of a game. After that, I dialed back the intensity of games I was testing by quite a bit and opted to run some Half-Life 2. With the resolution of 1600 by 900 and all the high highest settings aside from V-Sync, the average frame rate was an impressive 130 FPS. Simply put, the gameplay was flawless and provided the smoothest gaming experience out of all the Windows 10 gameplay samples. Next up was Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. With a resolution of 1440 by 900 and all the settings as high as possible, the E2220 was able to pull off a solid 53 FPS. At first, I thought that this number was way lower than it should have been, but then I remembered that I'm running Windows 10 as the operating system, something that the E2220 was not designed to do. However, I knew the Grand Theft Auto 3 would probably run just fine on this computer, and with all the highest settings and a resolution of 1600 by 900 it did just that. Just like CSGO, the overlay once again cut out on me, but the frame rate was easily over 60 FPS and played excellently. The final game I tested on this computer with Windows 10 was Far Cry 1. With the very and ultra high settings and a resolution of 1600 by 900 the game got an average of 43 FPS. However, the frame rate was very inconsistent, sometimes dropping as low as single digits while loading in new areas. With this, I turned on the settings to the medium preset and the average frame rate spiked up to a solid 98 FPS, over double what was achieved with the higher settings enabled. So that concludes the performance testing of the E2220 and how well it holds up in 2020 on the modern and more intensive operating system of Windows 10. I'm sure there's some Linux OS that's just as compatible and runs way better than Windows 10, but this is what's mainstream, so that's why I tested it. I also wanted to take a look at how this chip would have performed in its prime running an operating system that was actually intended for it, such as Windows XP. Setup for this OS was much easier than the setup for Windows 10 since the XP drive I had still maintained compatibility following the CPU upgrade. So let's Let's get right into it. The general desktop usage in Windows XP was flawless, with snappy responses and quick loading times across the board. I did have to reinstall the graphics drivers at one point, but when it was all up and running, the system performed very well. Because it ran so well, I then started up a couple different games, beginning with Far Cry 1. With the medium preset and a resolution of 1600 by 900, the average frame rate was an impressive 120 FPS. If you recall, I did this exact same test on Windows 10, but that average frame rate was only 98. But don't get me wrong, both are still amazing numbers to achieve, but a difference of 22 FPS is quite noticeable. The next game I ran on this hardware was 2004's title of Half-Life 2. This one genuinely impressed me, and with all the highest settings and a resolution of 1600 by 900, the average frame rate came to be 174, making it the best performing test out of all the ones I did on this computer. There was no stuttering, no drop in frame rate, nothing of the sort, making this the perfect Half-Life 2 experience. The last completely successful gaming test I did in this system was in playing a bit of Need for Speed Underground. With the highest settings and a resolution of 1280 by 
2024, the average frame rate was a solid 60 FPS where it was seemingly capped at. And I can't lie, considering that this game came out 17 years ago, it looks pretty good. However, this good graphical quality is definitely reflected in the hardware utilization because the V5800 Pro saw a constant usage at 99%, but the game ran great and looked decent, so I've no complaints. On the contrary, Call of Duty 2 wasn't such a pleasant experience. Whenever I would try to change any graphical settings, whether it be texture quality, resolution, or anything really, the game would instantly crash. Why? I don't know, but due to this, I was only able to play the game in its default resolution of 480p in all the lowest settings. On the bright side, the game ran well and got an average frame rate of 91 FPS where it was once again seemingly capped at. Kind of an odd number to limit a frame rate to, but it doesn't really affect gameplay. The last couple benchmarks didn't even work though, with Grand Theft Auto San Andreas failing to launch due to an audio card error and Grand Theft Auto 3 instantly freezing up as soon as it started loading. The past mark benchmark also didn't work, throwing up a floating point division by zero error, which I was unable to locate a fix for. So that's about how well the E2220 holds up in a modern setting, as well as how it performed with software appropriate for the time frame in which it was released. Overall, I'm pretty impressed with this CPU, especially in how well it held up during the Windows 10 gameplay benchmarking. This was, without a doubt, a significant upgrade from the old Pentium 4 631 installed in the box computer which was essentially unusable in Windows 10. In the OS benchmarking I did with this computer, I tested the two extremes really, with Windows XP being on the low end and Windows 10 being on the high end. Point is, there's possibly a sweet spot. Of of compatibility, performance, and support for operating systems somewhere between the two, maybe in the form of Windows 7 or even Windows Vista. Actually, probably not Vista. But I've actually had the CPU for quite a while, only recently remembering that I owned it in the first place. It was crammed into a small box with a few other processors as well, consisting of a couple older Pentiums and a decent third gen i5. After a bit of research, it turns out that not a single one of the motherboards I have officially supports any of the aforementioned chips. Officially. So I ended up shoving these random Pentiums into the box computer and hopes that one of them would actually work. I first tried it with the Pentium E5400 which refused to even get into BIOS, but the E2220 showcased in this video worked just fine. Just something to mention on the off chance that there was a performance decrease due to lack of official support even though I doubt such an issue exists in this case. In terms of what I'm going to do in the future of this chip, I might actually try a bit of overclocking because apparently the E2220 was a great CPU to overclock, reaching over 3GHz on the Intel stock cooler. I probably won't be doing this until I purchase some more RAM though. In some of the Windows 10 benchmarks and general testing, the RAM mostly saw significant utilization, possibly creating a slight bottleneck for the rest of the system. If I would have been able to fit 8GB of RAM into this computer, the Windows 10 test likely would have performed a bit better, but the fact that the motherboard only has two DIMM slots can be quite limiting. However, with the purchase of two 4GB sticks, this potential issue should quickly disappear. That's also why I ran Edge instead of Chrome during the Windows 10 usage testing. From my experience, Edge is a bit less resource demanding than Chrome, which is notoriously hungry for your system's memory, and just to keep things performing ideally, I opted to run the lighter of the two. Oh, and when I was doing the Passmark test, it turns out that the lowest score ever recorded was zero? How does that even happen? Like, you'd have to underclock your hardware so much, or at least I'd assume that you'd have to. I don't know, but it might make an interesting video premise, so let me know what you think. Regardless, thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video. Also, please leave a comment below because interactions with viewers will help boost this video in the YouTube algorithm and I guarantee that I'll respond to your comments. While you're at it, please subscribe because it helps a lot in video quality and production also positively affects my day. Finally, leave any questions or suggestions in the comments below and have a great day. Bye!